Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Maher. I'm the chair of the Citizens Vision Committee Fund, a group. <clears throat> um, I'm going to start out by introducing um, the committee members tonight. We're going to start, start with Al. Al Rodriguez. Kim Morshing. Jim Har. Marta Olson Rangich. Kevin Crosby. Beth Keeney. Bill Spindle. Christine Stephenson. Jim Keck. Jennifer Rice. Thank you. Um, so tonight is our fourth public hearing. Um, we have five presentations tonight. <clears throat> Just so you have a little background, there's nine voting members of our committee. Uh, the total, we had started out with 28 projects. The total ask, or the total project cost of all 28 projects was $95 million. Um, the ask for vision funds was $62.5 million and we have 24 million to allocate. Um, so we'll finish tonight and then we'll spend the next five or six weeks in working sessions to rank the projects and make our recommendation in early December to the city council. So with that, we'll go ahead and start the evening. We're gonna start out with uh, the School of Mines Stadium Project. Uh, good evening, uh, Jim Rankin, President of South Dakota Mines, and I'm going to have our Athletic Director, Joel Lucan, make our presentation, and I'll be available for uh, questions after that. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Rankin. Um, good evening, Vision Fund Committee. Thank you for providing us this time to present, and thank you for ser your service to our community. Um, O'Hara Stadium was dedicated on September 18th in 1938 with a victory over the South Dakota State Jackrabbits 18 to seven. The Hard Rockers went on to go eight and that year and claimed a conference title. I guess I should ask first, how do I, there we go, I figured it out. Um, one of the pillars of NCAA Division II athletic experience is engaging in our community building and developing long-lasting, trusting, and mutually beneficial relationships. Relationships that aim to enhance the community and create a greater sense of ownership for all parties. You see it all across the country with Division II institutions and their communities. O'Hare Stadium is the premier outdoor event center for football and track and field in Western South Dakota and has been a community use facility since the end of World War II. According to the State of South Dakota High School Association, the first state track meet was run at O'Hara in 1948. I was told by a, by a local community sports historian that high school athletics started utilizing uh, O'Hara shortly after World War II, also in 1945 and 1946. Current Stevens began using the facility in 1969 and Central in 1978. Hard Rocker Athletics and South Dakota Mines are alumni embrace the community engagement O'Hara Stadium brings to our campus. And in my opinion, selfishly, there's no better way to watch a football game than tailgating uh, while the game's going on. When uh, South Dakota School of Mines or the high school is not using the facility, the facility is open to the public and gets uh, numerous entities to use it. Um, you see on this slide here, the, obviously the school districts use it, the guards have used it in the past, the state association to host high school playoffs. Um, the game tonight between Central and, and Stevens is taking place at 6 o'clock. The fire department, uh, Black Hills Youth, 
We run camps with NFL Flag Football, Monument Health, Pennington County Sheriffs. Um, Friday night last week, Sturgis couldn't play at their field, so they gave us a call and they played after um, the local high schools played and we accommodated them to, to play their game. So we, we take great pride in having it stay a community facility and we'd like to continue that for the future. The proposed updates and renovations address accessibility concerns and create deck, direct route to seating. They will add an elevator to our press box and sky box. Currently, Stevens has a, has a football coach who is in a wheelchair and the individuals who like to use the sky boxes, uh, our alumni um, are getting to the, to the point in their careers where they need uh, help to get up steps. So creating an elevator would, would uh, or uh, putting in an elevator would help that out tremendously. Addressing those ADA concerns creates a need for new concessions because we would, um, we would take out the center section where you can see in this slide here, the interior updates, kind of the overview from looking up straight above. You see that, that blank spot between the women's and the men's restroom. Um, that's where the current concession stand sits. We would remove that and then that would allow better access for individuals who have uh, um, um, accessibility issues. Um, we would add a multi-purpose locker room. Um, currently, we do not have a facility at the stadium that accommodates female athletes. So if uh, a team would come and they need to, to uh, get dressed or change or use the facility, they need to come up to the King Center and, and, and get uh, addressed there. Um, that locker room would also accommodate high school football games on, on Friday nights and would be uh, part of the state track meet and any other event taking place at the stadium that would need um, the accommodations. It says new training room and laundry phys physicians exam room. Um, that is essentially just a medical examination room. Um, currently what we have is, is inside our locker room, our men's football locker room, which is really kind of a bad design. Um, that took place in the early 2000s. Um, with our plan to increase roster sizes for football and increase roster sizes for track and field, um, obviously that helps uh, us increase enrollment and, and helps the economic impact from South Dakota School of Mines. Sorry. Our proposal has 11 sky boxes. Um, these, these boxes would help create a more functional use facility. Currently right now, um, we have stats, we have home broadcasting, we have uh, home coaches, we have visitors coaches over on the south side of the stadium. And um, on any given game day for us, my staff is running back and forth with stats um, and it makes it much more functional for the state track meet, for high school football, for our football events, um, our track events, their track events, to have everything in one location. Um, this plan with the 11 sky boxes or the 11 box press boxes helps us accommodate that. That means everything for functionality would be on one side of the stadium. The facade, South Dakota School of Mines is the gateway to downtown Rapid City from the East Corridor. O'Hara Stadium is the first facility you see on campus coming from the East. We would like to increase the aesthetic appeal of the start of downtown Rapid City and make the stadium architecturally look like other campus buildings. We want to make it adaptive. So when the Cobblers play, whoever's the home team, if the Cobblers and the Raiders are playing, whoever's the home team, we have the ability, well, we will have the ability to make the, the front of the stadium look like a Central Cobblers uh, home game. Um, this upgrades, these upgrades uh, will help us attract more championships. Uh, prior to COVID, um, as the only Division II institution in Rapid City, uh, I was approached by Visit Rapid City and the Civic Center to uh, try to attract volleyball, uh, basketball, potentially wrestling championships. Um, enhancing our facility would also give us the ability to bid for NCAA championships in outdoor track and field. And then I would um, 
work with the state, work with the school district and the city and visit Rapid City and uh, eventually like to make a play or a push to have the state track meet here every other year rather than every third year. Um, this would, uh, in my opinion, help us continue to host the state track meet. Um, and obviously uh, the upgraded facilities, as I stated earlier, uh, we would like to take our roster in football from 105 to 125 and then uh, our track from 70 to uh, 100. Um, the economic impact of this project, this is uh, information from the 2016 South Dakota Board of Regents uh, economic impact in the state. Uh, but there's 238 million generated from South Dakota School of Mines annually in the state. 16 million is injected into the economy from mine students alone on day to day living. There is zero operating costs for the future for the city. Um, and the state track meet, which is the, at this point, the the pinnacle event that takes place at O'Hara um, that will go over a three day period of time. There's a new format, so it'll all be in Rapid City. There'll be at least 12,000 individuals come to witness this event, and that event alone has a $3 million impact. Thank you for your time, and as my history professor would say, questions, comments, or observations. Thank you. Um, committee members have questions? Uh, chair recognizes Bill Keck. I'm Jim Keck. Oops. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did that again. My brother. Yeah. Um, so you're asking the, the vision fund for the total funding here, where hasn't haven't past projects had the school district provide some of the funding, and they had the Rushmore Bowl to raise the funds, and and then I don't know if School of Mines gave money to it and so it was split a third, third, third or? Um, I, I, I don't know where the Rushmore uh, Bowl funding goes. So I, I, I apologize, I have no clue how the school district does. We do have a lease agreement with the school district. They lease the field. Um, some history with that, when I walked in, we were literally trading checks back and forth. Mm -hmm. When they would come to, we were writing, they were writing us a single check a, and to host a football game and then um, I just said, let's just do a flat fee with a, 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 an inflation increase. And we cut it back drastically because I know that they're in a, a significant financial issue in the athletic department. Um, so we, rough, we get roughly about fifty to $55,000 a year from the school district that goes into our maintenance and operations, um, custodial, taking care of the, the track, the turf, snow removal, all that, that stuff. Um, in the past, uh, we have not asked for all of it, and we are not asking for the entire allotment this time. We're asking for 5.7. The total project is 6.7 to $7 million. Um, we are starting to fundraise. I am quietly uh, talking to individuals. Dr. Rankin has been talking to individuals. Um, we would really like to be able to, to make a splash so to speak, if we know what we're getting from the vision funds and then have a better plan moving forward. Um, but, but that's what the Rushmore Bowl was set up for originally is to pay for improvements at the stadium, in particular the track and maybe the um, AstroTurf as far as I know. That, the, you're, you're the first so one who's ever All I'm told saying is there's, there's some other entities that could be participating. So, thank you. Yep. Other questions? Okay, I guess that, that is all the questions from the committee. We did really enjoy our visit. Yours was our first visit this fall, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank enjoy you. your evening. Okay, the next... Uh, the next proposal will be the Sioux Park Tennis Restoration Project. Excuse me, I have 13 copies of uh, part left. Right.
guys ready? Yes. Okay. Thank you guys for this opportunity and thank you for the visit when you came out to check out Sioux Park, those of you guys who made it. We really do appreciate it. I'm Jason Olson. I have been the Park and Rec tennis director for the last 34 years. Um, I've been the Stevens tennis coach now for 25 years. And uh, I grew up at Sioux Park playing tennis as a 10 year old. That's when I started playing tennis. So I've pretty much been there for 43 years now. And the first 20 years was the old Sioux Park. Then we redid Sioux Park about 20 years ago. And I've, so I've been there since we've redone Sioux Park. It's came to the point right now that we host the state tournament next year. And if we don't do something about Sioux Park after next year, we won't be hosting the state tournament anymore. It's getting to the point where we have to put so much money into Sioux Park every single season just to play in it. The two times now, three times now, that we've put money into Sioux Park just to be able to play in it because the ground is shifting so badly. And as you know, our team this last year um, just was lucky enough to capture a state tournament. Um, Rapid City Christian, who also plays there, got second in the state tournament. And we know Rapid City, is, Sioux Park, is the central place to play tennis. If you play tennis in Sioux Park outside, outside you're coming to Sioux Park. We've had so many people that play at Sioux Park. And as, as I put in the thing you've seen right now, that tennis is growing. Last year, tennis grew. The last two years, tennis grew across the country. Tennis, and it grew outside. It grew out on public courts. Not as much in the indoor places, but it grew outside because of COVID and everything. And tennis is just kind of regenerated. It's people that are coming back to tennis. And we're getting new people into tennis. And it's, it was deemed as one of the safest activities to do. And so we really capitalized on that. And if you look up you know, on, on the board there, most of the people that are playing are playing outside in public parks. And Sioux Park is known across the five state region as one of the top destinations to come play. Last year, we hosted a big level four national tournament. We've hosted many over the years. And we did a great job. Everything went great. But one thing they said is you guys have got to do something to these courts to keep getting these events. So at, at Sioux Park, you know, who plays there? Well, you guys can play there. Anybody can play there. Boys, girls, we have people in wheelchairs play there. We have seniors play there. We have juniors play there. I start lessons at age two, and I actually have somebody that's been taking lessons for me for all 34 of my years. He's still there. And we have just everybody can use Sioux Park. And Sioux Park is busy. If you see up on the, the board right now, we start with Sioux Park in March with school activities going on to all the USD activities, the leagues, the Black Hills Tennis Association leagues, all the summer tournaments, everything. The two schools use it as their home base, but other schools play there. We have so many events that are going on at Sioux Park, and it gets used just nonstop. And there's actually a group of ladies that play every single week, and they will play all the way until the new year. They get outside even in December. They played the day after that snowfall, the big snowfall. We had just come They played the next day. They got a court ready, and they played. I mean, everybody can play there. And in some places, you know, I'm, I'm a sports person. If you know me in Rapid City, sports is a really big part of my life. I love baseball. I love everything. The nice thing about Sioux Park is it's a public courts. Anybody can use it. People driving through town can stop and use the courts. And it is, you know, a beautiful location. It's the main outdoor place with the football field, the baseball fields there, the track, everything. Sioux Park is where people come for everything. And if you've looked at Sioux Park and you guys have got to go out there, it is getting to the point where it is dangerous. We had a girl two years ago slip on the court that shouldn't have been, but it's where water stands and you can't get it, get it done. It comes almost moldy. She had to have a couple surgeries. We had some kids this year, a kid from um, St. Thomas More tripped going out of the complex because of the way the land has shifted. The concrete goes like here and shifted and luckily landed and hit her head on her bag instead of hitting her head on the concrete. My mother, if you know my mom, Judy Olson, um, she was there watching tennis this summer and this isn't on the courts, this is outside the courts and tripped on one of the things where it shifted. In the last couple of months, the ground is, is shifting more and it keeps shifting. And part of the problem is, if you know where that land was before, it was a marshy area. It was a swamp years ago before they put Sioux Park in there. So there's a lot of water under there. And we had FMG came in and, and dug down and did all the soil samples and know what we have to do to fix it. You know, if we fix these courts, we're going to get a lot more events, and we're going to keep getting events. And we know that we don't have a big group of people like a baseball league or anything like that. These are public courts. These are city courts. You know, I've worked for the Park and Rec for now for 34 years. And 
like I said, this last summer was our biggest summer ever. We had the most revenue we've ever had in the history. We had the most numbers. We had 390 people. One of our biggest years, year before last year, we had over 700 people do tennis just last summer. So tennis is growing, and that's just park and rec people. That's people who are paying to take lessons from the park and rec department. That's not talking about the tournaments and talking about everything else that those courts are being used for. We raise a lot of money to give scholarships for kids that can't afford to play, no matter who they are, what side of town they come from. They can ride rapid ride to come home from the north side. I used to teach at North for years. I got kids from there to come. We, we want it to be accessible to everybody, and we do that. Anything we can do to keep people playing, we give a ton of scholarships out, raised through tournaments to help kids there. We also got a grant from the USCA to help do the soil sample, because it was a $10,000 soil sample just to get, to get it done to see what's wrong with these courts and how we can fix them. The problem is you see that they're, they're, they're unrepairable. I had a friend keep going, take pictures from up above. And if you see right there, when you're up above, it, you can see the cracks. You, you can see where it's going. And there's places that the cracks, when we come back in March to play boys tennis, we're going to have to put a lot of money in it just to play the season because the cracks get so bad throughout the off season. Each time in the winter, they just keep getting worse. And it's not all, when we built these courts 20 years ago, we did not have the technology that they have available now. Parkview, which is the courts where Central plays out on the other side of town by the Parkview complex, they're built with post tension, which means is there's a system underneath that pulls them together. So when weather comes, like we have in this area, it pulls them back and the cracks don't come. So the only thing you would have to do to maintain Sioux Park for the next probably 50 years is just paint it when it needs to be repainted. The cracks are not going to come back because they're guaranteed with this post tension system. And I didn't believe it until I saw Spearfish had it done, Yankton's had it done. Nobody's had cracks. The Ankton courts have been there for like 15 years. They don't get any cracks. If you do, it's like a hairline that you can't even see. And if you go out there and play, it is, it is dangerous. There's courts that, that drop down like this, and the water sits in there and come up to your ankles. And we just have to get these courts fixed because we can't afford to keep losing everything to Sioux Falls. Right now, like if we don't do something, we're going to lose the track meet. We're going to lose state tennis. We're going to lose national tournaments. Sioux Falls is already building a 12-court complex that they're expecting to be done in the next year. And so we have, we have to get it. We can't keep going and just saying it's okay because it's not just that. It's the revenue is important. The state tournaments have brought in over $7 million since we've had them. We've hosted 16 state tournaments since Park, Sioux Park was built. And that's, that, that's a lot of money. And yes, in the long run, it took care of what Sioux Park cost. But there's a bigger thing. If we want people to stay in Rapid City, to keep their families here, keep their children here with the job force and all those things, we need to have facilities that are for everybody to use. Baseball field's great, but you and I can't go play there. You know, all the other places, we can't go play there. Here you can go play. We have pickleball people that play at Sioux Park all the time. We have, you know, tons of people. It's a workout facility. And these courts are so amazing. It's such a great complex. And when you're sitting out there, you don't see it until you come in to see what's really going on at Sioux Park. And I, I believe that it's, it is really our duty to fix these courts as, as a city because these are public city courts. And I know we've talked about Park and Rec and all those things, but we have to get help. We were hoping for vision fund, I mean, hoping for COVID money, but they had too many important projects to go there. And they kind of pushed us towards, they knew that the council, that vision funding is where we're gonna to have to go. And so that's why we've moved this way. And if you haven't seen the courts in the Zekus, go out and see them, go out and check them the next month and see what happens to them, because they're gonna keep getting worse, especially as the winter comes, keeps it going. We did have the largest team between the largest team, Stevens High School, and the, and the whole five state region the last couple of years. Um, Rapsy Christian, ton of kids. And like I said, those are just the people that are playing there for school tennis. There's so many more people. And the financial impacts, you know, we, we have a new person at Visit Rapid City. They're totally behind us because they understand. Um, all of the tournaments that we get generate so much revenue. That national tournament, we had so many nights in bed. The average day was four nights for people coming for a two day tournament. Some people stayed longer, and it's not just that. You know, you think about just hotels and beds because that's the formula they used to use. Well, now you look at the impact of jobs and the, and, the, and the things that it does for people, and they don't just stay right at the tennis courts. They go everywhere, and they spend a lot of money, and they do a lot of things to, to help our community financially. Like I said, we had 721 people that paid to play tennis through the Park and Rec program. If you count everything else that paid just for free and stuff, there were thousands of people that played there last year and last summer alone. 
but we don't want to, we don't want to lose that. I got to the point where they were wondering if they have to put a lock on the door and shut it down. And if they shut it down with four schools having to use one facility, it's going to be really tough for high school tennis for tennis to grow. And it is growing. We're expecting each school, St. Thomas Smart, they're all growing. Central, they're all growing. And we have to have this facility here to be able to keep tennis to growing, but also, like I said, for our community, because it is so important. We, you're going to ask me about money. Well, we're going to, hopefully, to the USDA, we're going to be able to get some more money. We're going to be able to get some help. But really, as our group, we need Vision Fund money to make this happen. The last thing before I'm done, I, I just want to read what, what was given to me. The importance of upgrading facilities such as Sioux Park in order to stay competitive with other markets and continue to grow the economic impact opportunities is essential. It would allow us more opportunities to attract national level tournaments which allows for even more economic impact, quality of life, and more opportunities for our youth which also appeals to parents. These fact factors into whether families stay here or move away for more opportunities for their children or move here from other areas of the country. Upgrading Sioux Park is one of the many that will help our workforce problems as well. We need a larger workforce in Rapid City, but we aren't, gonna, aren't enticing people to stay or relocate here with their families. Then what are we doing? This is one facility, but as you can see, it impacts so much more than anyone can realize long term. And that came from Visit Rapid City. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Does the committee have any questions? Oh, Jim Keck is recognized. Hey, Jason, um, did you say, how much did you say a, a state meet brought into town? Well, all of the state meets kind of combined. It's, it's about, for one state tournament, it's about, state. Four, about 400,000 with the new numbers. That they have a new formula that actually they pay for it. They used to just do this heads and beds and estimate, but now the Visit Rap City has an actual formula. You you have some of that documents there. But when we had a 25-team tournament before it broke to two classes, they generate about 400,000 is what they're estimating per tournament. Okay, and so that's, that's women's and then men's would be Yeah, 400. so it's roughly around 800,000 So that's for first state tournament. Yeah. And you're saying without these improvements, <clears throat> next year will be the last. It, it, it'll be the last because mm -hmm. Sioux Falls is building it. They've never had a 12-core facility and they're gonna, yeah. they're gonna get it and we won't get it back. Because yeah. if you look, there's five teams that play tennis out here and there's 20 teams right in the Sioux Falls area. What's, what's the cost to repair the? To do the whole facility is uh, $3.3 .3 million to do it all. To yeah, fix but just, everything. I mean, just the repairs you're currently doing each oh, year. Each time we do it out, and the guy gives us a deal, it's like $10,000 just to come fill cracks. Now, the couple of years, five years ago, we did a, kind of a major thing where we had to share, we all shared Parkview for a couple months, and that was one hundred fifty. Grand, and the guy told us it would be a Band-Aid, and within a month, everything he did, it looked like he didn't do it. Other than the color looked good, all the cracks were back, and we got cracks where we didn't have them before. The land underneath is just so, it's a swamp. We could, we could probably uh, dig, dig down and have a well there. <laughs> so will, will this project bring in some drainage? Will yes, drainage yes, in? FMG went through it all, and we had environmental studies and everything. They dug down in our courts, and it'll, and it'll take care of all of those things, because they, they had, they have the technology now that they didn't have 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it came, sadly, it came a year after Sioux Park was done. This new technology came our way. So, so finally, um, you say high school tennis uses the facility. Do you have an agreement that allows that? And can that be pulled out from under you? or? No, we have, we have an agreement with the whole Sioux Park area, it's not just there, it's the baseball fields and everything that came way back to the agreement with Sioux, the whole Sioux Park area, which goes all the way to Sioux Sand, what they can be used for recreational facilities and school facilities. So we have it in the lease. Well, the high school can always be used. The now. public schools, but we all, we share it with Rapid City Christian okay. and St. Thomas More and Parkview share um, Parkview. They, okay. they share that facility. All right, thank you. Yep. So just to clarify, uh, Sioux Park tennis courts are located on city land, correct? Parks and Rec. If, it's kind of weird if you understand the Sioux Park area. From the tennis courts or, or city land, and from the football field over, it's school land. So if you ever go up there and you, you see it as like that fence, and but they work together. It's a joint agreement. But really, the city com completely maintains Sioux Park. 
the schools does has chipped in and we've chipped in. Stevens Tennis has raised a lot of money over the years for new windscreens and the sound system Stevens paid for and all the benches and all that. So it's we do a lot since we play there. We raise a ton of money. And you see Mitch back there. Mitch, if you don't know Mitch in Rapid City, everybody that knows Mitch, um, Mitch makes Sioux Park what it is as well, the maintenance. We have a, a free maintenance person. So we, we do a lot together with them, but financially it's the city's land. Other committee members? Uh, the chair recognizes Christine Stephenson. I'll be quick because we're running out of time. But So in your proposal, you have that... Um, for safety alone, 2.2 million. Now, just to clarify, does that 2.2 million solve? I mean, your immediate needs. That's the post-tension courts and makes makes that facility state I, tournament worthy. I just talked to FMG tonight about before I came here about it because he wanted to break it up just so you could see the numbers. But honestly, to to do it right, you need to do it all because it's not going to fix the stuff outside of the courts. All of the things, it's people just, if the courts are a big deal, but, you know, if my mother would have tripped and fallen and cracked her head there, that could have been catastrophic for all of us. And it would have been negligent, negligence on our part because we know the land has shifted. We've said it. I've been saying it f for years. Like I said, of 34 years, and since this first was built, a year afterwards, I said there was issues already because of the land. So I think to do it right and to protect ourselves, we, we have to fix it all. But... If you just do the bare minimum and then do the others in steps, you can. But then, of course, as you know anything, the costs are going to go up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wait five years to do it again, it's probably going to be a lot more than what it was. Sioux Falls is what they're doing. Their, their facility is more than ours, and they're putting it in a, a swampy land, too, where, they, where Sioux Falls flooded last year. They're putting it there, and so they're having to do a lot to get it to this point, too. Thank you. So I know you were trying to get this approved earlier this year. Um, if we were to award you, the, the council was to award you money in December uh, for next year, how, how would the construction work around the tennis season? That's a great question. Well, we, we made it work. I mean, Keith in here knows we made it work for a year, didn't we? <laughs> it was tough. We had like 80 kids playing on one court. But if, if they do, it's like they say it's about 11-month time frame to do it all because of the planning. Now, if M FMG was able to get the contract, it would be shorter because they, they already have it ready, but it may go out for bids and stuff. So they have the bid process, and then they get you know everybody else to come in for the design work, the design work and then the bid process. But he thinks if we, let's say, we have the state tournament next year. In, in May, we have the boys in 22, and then we have the girls in October. If we were able to start after the girls' season was done, we would probably miss, we would miss a boys' season and a girl season, maybe only one of them, but maybe two, but we would have it by the time our rotation came back for the state tournament. And th we, they did vote a couple years ago to host the state tournament in Rapid City every year. But because of our facility being the way it was, I, we just didn't feel like we could do that. So, but now that won't happen because Sioux Falls is up there. They want it, they want to keep it there. So they did that, but we will have it guaranteed every other year if we fix our facility, which means two tournaments every year. And not even that, it's the national tournaments. I mean, it's all the other stuff we bring in. We were told to bid for a level one tournament, which is level one is the highest possible tournament you can get for summer tennis. It could be hundreds of people, and they're going to be here for a week. And it's, it's not do they come. They come because it's a major, it's like the U.S. Open of juniors tournaments. So if we get this done and do this whole facility, we are going to get a lot bigger tournaments. We could be getting some college events, which we've never hosted. We would have a college facility with the design that we put in there that could be used for so many things. Okay. Uh, any more questions from the committee? Um, the chair recognizes Marta olson Rangich. Jason, just to follow up on what you were just saying about tournaments, how many USDA sanctioned tournaments are currently held in Rapid City? About six every summer. We have some others during the winter, but summertime's about six just depends like we we didn't bid for a couple that we could have gotten because of our court situation or we would have had a couple more but this next summer we are we're guaranteed four right now and we're in the bid process to get two more and for kids who are working on um, national usta ranking how many tournaments do they have to play in a summer to maintain their ranking well it's a different system now but you have to have so many points to, to get to these events but our level five tournaments and stuff we're always kind of on an island in rapid city we have to go to sioux falls we have to go to minneapolis to get to play 
we would hope be able to host two to four of those tournaments that would be able to keep our local kids to give them a fair shot and not have to travel 10 hours, five hours every single weekend to get to these tournaments. But you would also pull in kids from Wyoming and Montana and North Dakota and um, possibly as far away as Colorado. Our national tournament a couple of years ago, we had 38 states represented. This last one was 20 some states represented. We had a kid from Puerto Rico and a kid from Guam as well because they want to come to the Black Hills. When they said, they looked at the Sioux Falls tournament, which was two weeks before our same tournament, and they looked at Rapid City and they're like, okay, we can go to the falls in Sioux Falls. In Rapid City, we can go to the Black Hills. We can see so many things. And a lot of people, not, it was a total accident. We didn't mean this to happen. Montana scheduled a tournament four or five days after us. So a lot of people made the trip, just went here. Now we're gonna go up to Montana and go to the Bighorns and play in the tournament up there. And so now we're like, oh, let's keep that because it's a real, it's a destination place. And a lot of these people from New York, I mean, Arizona, they loved it. You know, um, we rented our car, we rented everybody, our friends rented their cars because you couldn't get a car last summer, but we made it happen and it was, it was amazing. We have that same tournament again this next summer too, the level four tournament. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? The chair recognizes Kevin Crosby. I apologize, I missed the site visit, so I may have missed this, but the current lighting, is that available for the public to use or is that only scheduled for events and then the LED lighting, uh, would that just be available? I could go up and push a button and use that in the evenings? We have five courts that are lit. We used to have all 12 courts lit, but when the city wanted to cut back and save money, they took off some of the ones. I don't know what the money savings is, but we still have five courts. If there's ever an event, we turn them on, or if there's they're totally full and I'm there, or Mitch isn't there, and we have a lot of people waiting to play and it's getting dark, we turn them on and then they go off, they go off at a certain time. But right now, if you want to go play tonight, you just go hit the button for racquetball or tennis and five courts will be lit. And in the wintertime, usually, you're not going to need more than five. In the summertime, I get a lot of phone calls that say, will you come on down and turn these other set of lights on for us? And I do because you don't want to alienate your tennis community because they're, they're very strong and they, you, you want to give them a chance to play when they can. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. And you know, we did enjoy our visit to Sioux Park. Um, like I told you, Jason, I, I drive by that those courts every day, and they look fine to me. You actually have to walk out on the courts to see the condition. You definitely can ask these two state champions right here. They'll they'll tell you. She plays on one of the courts, one of the worst. <laughs> thank you very much, thank you guys. Okay, our next presentation will be the Special Olympics of South Dakota and the Rapid City Flame. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for all the listening you're doing. I'm sure you're tired by this time of day. Appreciate the opportunity to do this. This presentation is about fun. I'm not bringing in a lot of dollars or uh, tournaments. We expect that to grow, but this is about bringing the community together in fun. Why is Special Olympics even presenting this to you? The reason is we have the largest bocce league in the state. At 350 people right now, it's grown 20% in three years. We started with uh, 40 people, now we're at 350. It's a great outdoor sport. Every uh, other year, the state will bring 1,000 people in here to have a state bocce tournament. Um, this is a project that we can market as a rapid city recreation destination. Special Olympics in the last decade has, is the vanguard of pushing to have all people treated as equals, that all people have access to services and opportunities. The revolution is inclusion, is their current direction, and that's what they're pushing for. It's not the old Special Olympics where you saw uh, people with minimal and extreme disabilities playing together. 
Today what we do is bring community members in. So our middle school kids have typical middle school kids playing with them. Our high school kids all the same. Um, parents and siblings and families are a huge part of Special Olympics. They're about half of our population in, in some of our sports. What Special Olympics found is that this 5,000 year old sport brought community together. All people, all ages, all skills, all abilities love this game. We get somebody out to play once, they're back. Why is it such a great game? I don't know. Um, it has this very long history, and in the Roman Empire they used it for troops to relax them. This was their form of relaxation. The game is very relaxing and you can play, as I said, with anybody. It's a great equalizer. So that's Cavan, one of our athletes up there. Um, I might say that I'm smarter than Cavan. I can read better than Cavan. But you know what? Cavan can beat me in Pachi because he's got much superior eye-hand coordination. So as we look at people who are playing bocce, we don't know who's going to excel, but we have athletes that are incredibly good at this. So bocce brings the community together, and if anybody doesn't know, we're talking about that northwest corner of Omaha and Mount Rushmore, more, where there used to be six tennis courts just south of Central High School. The object of the game there's two people on two sides playing against each other, and the object of the game is to get your team's balls as close as possible to the target ball. It's similar in some respects to billiards, to lawn bowling, to croquet, to lots of different games. So there are two big things that might be different about this project. The first thing, this is city property of course, is that there's infrastructure in place on that corner. That infrastructure is unused right now. So there's a parking lot, and yes there's some dollars in there to improve the accessibility of the parking lot. There is lighting in place. The ground is level already and drains fairly well. Those are things we're looking for. There is sewer and water there. So the only thing that has to happen is you get a prefab restroom and drop it in, in place, and then we have restrooms there. So a lot of the monies that it might take to build this from scratch have already been spent and they exist in the place. Let's see. So the funds can create a recreation destination for South Dakota. There is no place like this in the entire five state region. Bocce is the fastest growing ball sport in the world. Tennis and uh, golf are the first two most popular ball sports, but bocce is coming up. We expect that if we had a place to play bocce, this would grow. It's popular with seniors. Seniors here in Rapid City already play. It's popular with families because you can start them at three, four years old and, and grandma and grandpa can also play. The park and rec department has already indicated they would start summer programs, they would start year-round leagues, they would help uh, help get this to be a successful project. The second thing is we are willing, Special Olympics is willing to donate $120,000 to get this done. We need this done. We know the sport is growing. We know as soon as the courts are available that the uh, growth will come and that it will be beneficial. It's at a highly visible corner, and I don't know if there's any questions about dollars. We'll keep going here. The Rapid City Parks Department will 
project manage this, contract it out, build it, operate it, and maintain it. Why would they do that? Number one, they have infrastructure that's unused and they have a piece of real estate that's in the center of the city that's just sitting there vacant. Court materials, there's a lot of information out there and every bocce player has an opinion on how the bocce court could be made, but there's no doubt in my mind that the Park and Recs Department have the engineering capability to build us something very incredible. The court costs vary, but the basic line is if you put a lot of money into it, you don't have to do the maintenance. If you want to build it for cheap, then you're going to have a lot of maintenance every year. So the end of this is imagine that in the, in the rapid center, which this corner is, it's right square in the center of the map, there's a landmark corner that tells everybody, turn here to get to the monument. It's an instantly recognizable corner. There's all kinds of people with vibrant activity going on during the daytime and at night. The vision funds can create here a highly visible outdoor recreational space in the center of the city that uses existing infrastructure, is supplemented by a $120,000 donation, and the city owns it after that. And in think naming rights, creative people could come up with lots of ideas to carry this forward. Any comments here? Okay, so that's the end of the presentation, so please feel free to ask any questions. Okay, my, my, my first question would be, isn't there a, a building on that site now? Or is it, was it an old restroom or something? That was an old restroom and it's currently used as a uh, storage facility. The plumbing is no longer good. They wouldn't hook it back up as a restroom, but the sewer and water pipes are right there. So if you take that building out, drop in a prefab restroom, you have restrooms. Thank you. And then this would be designed to use the existing lights? Yes. The existing lights are perfect. Okay. Uh, committee members, uh, the chair recognizes Bill Kendall. Spindle. <laughs> Tough name. So uh, Special Olympics would manage these courts? And the park and wrap park. wood. So what role would you play? Uh, we're giving you $120,000 and we're making the case that this is something that will bring the community together, that it's open for everyone, it would be enjoyed by everyone, and in addition, presumably leagues would start up and there would be tournaments there. So let me ask it a different way. So would Special Olympics kids have priority to use this? Uh, I would hope so. You know, I, there's, I assume that all has to be done in a contract if we decide. Would they bring their own bocce balls? Is that how this would work? Yes, yes. So what we do today is we take an hour to set up. We use 12 courts every week. It's Sunday afternoon. So what Special Olympics for the courts, we don't use them uh, for an extensive period of time. We also have the adult Special Olympics, which is run out of the storm, run out of the works, and they also have plenty of bocce players. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be running it. We're not, we have no paid employees. We have nobody we could offer to help maintain it. In speaking with Jeff Bigler, he said they have systems set up for, for reservations for other uh, facilities in this city, and for leagues, and for things that have multiple courts. And so they would extend that system to include the bocce courts. I just want to make sure the Special Olympics kids will get, be able to come use it, so it won't be you know, the rest of the town taking it over. Oh, this is great. We love this game, and those poor kids don't get to play. No, I hope we would prevent that from happening. Right. Right. We practice right now on Sunday afternoon. We have a difficult time getting facilities. 
we do have, we had uh, a gym at the Black Hills Works that we use and that we have priority for, so that's very nice. But we would get to use it. That doesn't overly concern me because we'd find a time that it wasn't being used and reserve it. So when you've done the Special Olympics at Star of the West, you just kind of lay out the courts with ribbons, right? I mean, Yes, and every Sunday we lay out a dozen courts at Parkview for practice. So what you've seen at Star of the West is when we have tournaments and meets, and people do come across, from across the state to do that. I spoke with the, uh, the head of Special Olympics and said, if we do this, if we could achieve this, would you come out every year for the state tournament? And the answer was, we can't promise that, but we'd like to, but for sure we'd be there every other year. Okay. I have more questions? Mark Harlow, I'm a volunteer with Special Olympics, uh, along with Jack Linus and Monica. We started this program 14 years ago, and we've seen it grow from 20 athletes now to several hundred, and having access to some of the best facilities in the state. When we started, we practiced track in a parking lot at the Senior Center. We practiced basketball in the armory uh, on rollaway baskets because we couldn't find a gymnasium. And we practiced softball in ankle-deep weeds over at Rushmore Park. And with the years passing, we now have access to the Parkview fields. We have access to the works gym. We have access to the tech track and their gyms for our tournaments. So this is just another rung and a very tall ladder that we're trying to build to provide these opportunities for these Olympians to be included. And to your question, sir, we would ask to reserve it on special times like any other, any other sports team would, a gym, a tennis court, or anything of that nature. But uh, this is just another opportunity. And as Monica stated, the, the interest in this is just growing in leaps and bounds. And it is what we call a unified sport. So we have our Olympians playing with other athletes and other family members. Uh, my granddaughter, who was here with us tonight, was one when we started this program. She's now 15, and we've watched it grow. And she's a unified athlete and plays with our basketball team and our softball team. So the impact on the community is really extraordinary in terms of bringing people together and giving our Olympians a chance to, to be included and to succeed and, in fact, excel. So we thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, does the committee have any more questions? Uh, the chair recognizes Christine Stephenson. Has Special Olympics asked for any other vision funding in the past or received any vision funding? No, no, we haven't looked at it in the past. And your funding is all donations? Yes, and it is. Okay. Yes. Okay, any other questions? The chair recognizes Kevin Crosby. What ongoing operating expenses would you expect for this facility, for the city, for this facility? Electricity for the lights, I imagine. Can you help me think through what else there would be? Sure, it would be cleaning. There would have to be garbage cans there, so you'd have to get the garbage emptied. Clean, cleaning being the restrooms. Depending on your court material, there are varying amounts of maintenance. If you pay $28,000 per court, there's no maintenance for five years. If you pay $8,000 for a court, you're going to maintain that to the cost of a couple thousand every single year. You have to make changes. Um, so it is budgeted at $20,000 per court. And those of us sitting at the table felt very comfortable that we could get a material and a build structure, a construction that would require maintenance every three to five years. So something that's reasonable. Other than that, you know, their IT work for running the leagues, um, their costs for instruction because they, they spoke of summer programs. I'm sure that has some cost. But all of the dollars here are 2022 dollars 
which were approved by the Park and Rec Department. What does that even mean? Well, it means we figured out what it ought to cost and add 25, added 25 percent. So this is not a, uh, this is a very conservative budget in that we should come under, we should come under budget on it. Would there be any irrigated grass area as part of this? That's to be decided, but a lot of the photos, I've looked at a thousand photos of different courts around the world. Um, probably it would be surrounded by uh, a hard surface. So something that would work for wheelchairs, it, it would all be accessible. Um, cement's probably too rough. I don't, somebody in construction would determine what that is. But then around that would be green space in my mind's picture. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, Chair recognizes Christine again. Um, I apologize. My other question was, th these numbers that you gave us, you indicated the city, you came up with these numbers with the city. Yes. And then the city has verbally acknowledged that they are okay, they have a budget for maintaining this for the next two decades. Because they the have. Because is low. They have. And okay. I have copies of the presentation here, but you'll see on the last page, after the presentation was complete, and I met back with, uh, spoke with Jeff Begler, he approved putting his name at the bottom of the final sheet. So yes, I received tremendous support from the Parks and Recreation Department. This is not the first time they've been asked to create bocce courts. Uh, they've been asked, I think, a couple times over three years. And there were thoughts of, okay, let's take out the two horseshoe courts that are left, or the two other courts that are next to the horseshoe courts. But that never got done. Um, Jeff's words to me, and it was more than once, so I feel comfortable quoting him, this is exactly what vision funds are intended for. Something that brings the community together. What I love is the vision of a thousand people driving into the monument, coming here for an event, and as they're turning that corner, that corner is being used. We got 40, 50 people maybe in there, maybe it's 10 or 12 people, but we have people outside during the day and at night enjoying our great outdoors here. Yeah, we have visited with Jeff and he, he seemed to be pretty excited about the fact that the lights are already there. So. And the plumbing, the sewer. Go ahead. You know, so we did this once before, so we approached Black Hills Works uh, when we didn't have a basketball court that Dr. Harlow was talking about. That we were in the armory and we were setting up our own portable hoops. and. We approached them and said, you know, we need a court to call home, practice and, and, uh, and, uh, and compete and hold, maybe hold a tournament, a regional or a state tournament. And, and we approached the works and said, you know, I know you're going to remodel that, uh, that army across the street from our office. They said, how about if we raise some money for you and we put in a really nice court? So we raised $120,000 $120, and we put that court in, in Black Hills Works. And, and all we asked is that we could call it home. Um, that we could practice there, and we said, "Here's where we're going to practice. It's going to be the same time during this, the, our, only during our season, and that we could hold a tournament or two there that would actually bring money to the community." And I said, "I think the community might even use it because it's going to be a lot better court, and and it's, and it's proven. the uh, The community is using that as well as Black Hills Works all day long, and they got a really cool court they, that they can call home as well. So it's the whole combination of community." business, volunteers, bringing something together that everybody can enjoy. And, you know, bocce is growing as fast as, as Monica says, but you, know, you, you compare like you know, pickleball, some of these things that are happening for just everybody with, a, with all abilities, you know, older, younger, you know, families. And, and uh, it's, it's a, it's a good, good, good thing for that location. I'm kind of watching what's going on at that location, and I don't like what I see. So I think it's a nice, thing, nice addition to that. Um, we like the fact that we can bring some seed money. We're gonna, we raise that money. We already have raised that money, so it's ready to go. And, and then, you know, after that, you know, all we want is, is practice in a couple tournaments and, 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 and some competition. 
and we're not asking for a whole lot. We think it's a really good deal for the community. My name is Jack Linus, by the way, and I'm with Mark and Monica on this, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, it's about our time. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for the opportunity. We look forward to uh, visiting with you again next week. Yes, the site visit is next Wednesday at 4, so anybody can come out. Okay, we have our next presentation will be um, the YMCA. Hi, I'm Keys Larson, uh, the CEO of the YMCA, um, not the person that you normally would probably see. Everyone's used to Roger Gallimore, but um, new transition and we're great. He started us in a great direction, so we're excited to continue to keep the movement going at the Y. Um, our presentation today is, is about our kitchen design, and I want to first of all thank all the committee members. Uh, you, those that came during the first tour and those that couldn't come made up that time so thank you so much for coming to see the Y project. I just wanted to talk a little bit about where we've been. Um, COVID, none of us knew that COVID was going to happen and literally uh, many of you may not know that the YMCA was a very uh, tenuous organization across the nation. Um, 200 Ys across the nation closed their doors permanently after COVID, but we were very blessed and um, we have a wonderful supportive community behind us um, because the YMCA really meets so many needs in our community. Uh, during COVID, uh, during the mandated closures and everything else, we did have to uh, furlough over 190 uh, employees so that, that our other choice was to close the Y permanently. But what we didn't close during that time was the YMCA kitchen staff. Uh, we really knew that that uh, program that we offered uh, filled a huge need in our community. And so I wanted to just spotlight the wonderful work in our kitchen that we have done since March 2020. We know that in Pennington County, the overall food insecurity rate is, is extremely high, 11.5%. Uh, the child food insecurity rate is 17.8. The YMCA has been a member of Collective Impact uh, for over five years. We were one of the uh, original members of that group working on food security in our community. Um, great partnerships. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with the school district. We know that during the school year, the kids are fed at school, and during the summertime when school is not in session, the YMCA has always been open for free meals for kids throughout the summer. We had partnerships with Wavy. We know that that is another agency that struggles to provide important community needs in our communi community, and the needs that they don't need to concentrate on is providing food for their uh, people. So we had taken over a lot of their um, feeding, especially during the summers when it's the most packed, so that their counselors can really do that important work. We have a great relationship with One Heart. Um, they're just getting off the ground, but we are going to support their child care and run their child care system. The YMCA's child care system, as you know, in the community is one of the best child care facilities and also supports great early childhood learning. Well, we know that those kids can't get to where they need to be when they haven't been fed. And so the YMCA serves 700 meals right now a day. Seniors, we have a partnership with Meals on Wheels, uh, Wavy, uh, and then all of the kids that we take care of in the school system. Uh, after school, we have 11 after school programs in the schools, and then we also have childcare in our facility of over 300 children under the age of five. So a little bit, all of you were great when we did our walkthrough, um, a little bit about our uh, project. I'm, I'm happy we have great support from board members of the YMCA, uh, Steve Burgess from Dean Kurtz Construction, and I also see Chris Kilpatrick here, 
and Austin William White, William White from uh, Monument Health, we have great support for the needs of the Y. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about with the Y is the original kitchen, which is on that left-hand side of uh, your diagram. It's the lower left-hand side. That is the current kitchen that we are serving right now all of these meals out of. It was built in 1968 has not changed since 1968, and the original plan was to feed 50 members a day. That was what the original kitchen design was made to feed. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are serving over 700 a day, mostly seniors and um, children in our community. And like we had with COVID, uh, the YMCA has a wonderful emergency response plan for food now since COVID. Uh, that was one of the things that the RAP, uh, YMCA we put in place. That was definite need that our community had. And so now we have an emergency response plan to deal with any other situations that happen and we can put that into place immediately just like we did in COVID. So needless to say that was the original size of the kitchen. We are looking at expanding the kitchen uh, into uh, pretty much our cafe area that serves uh, this population of people and it's going to be about 1800 square feet. Uh, I kind of worked through that with most of you. Uh, we are proposing a walk-in refrigerator system and a walk-in freezer situation. Uh, at this point, we know that um, we've just had to accumulate pieces of equipment and we've stuck them in the hallways so that we can take care of the number and the amount of food that we have to do in a day. And we've also utilized um, places for putting the food and the packaged meals together hallways, we've created different spaces that um, just work okay, but not great. Uh, the committee asked some great questions while they were walking through. I wanted to address the fact of how many more meals could the YMCA prepare if we uh, did this expansion. Uh, it works out that it could more than double the capacity of the meals that we're currently preparing. So it was somewhere in that uh, 1,500 area of meals per day to prepare for those particular people. Um, another thing the committee asked as they were going through is a breakdown of those costs. Many of you know the YMCA. Um, we don't pad anything. We are always trying to utilize our dollars to the best of their ability. And in the original project that we submitted, uh, we had demolition and construction estimate, as you see there, uh, and the built-in kitchen equipment. At that time, uh, we didn't separate the two amounts of equipment, but we have done that in the handouts that we passed out to you uh, this evening. For a total cost of 571728 um, As many of you know, these proposals were due uh, a short while ago, but in, even in the meantime, we've been able to, to look at some more extra costs and things that would uh, be entailed for this particular project. Um, as I spoke to the committee, um, serving food is always difficult because you're in that transition phase. We'd really like to be begin uh, in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, we have several areas that are the transition periods. I spoke to the committee about the fact that the school year serving, which is a September through a May uh, time period, has kind of an end before we start the summer feeding. And there's some transition times where we could adjust the kitchen project to use half of it. Well, the kitchen project right now, as it's proposed, would be the half that we're using right now. So we have been proven that we can do that in a small area while other parts are in construction to improve the flow. And again, I just wanted to talk about the community needs that the YMCA uh, really is here for the community. We've always been here for the community. The YMCA is an agency that always steps up in any time of need. Uh, we have great relationships with city, collective impact, and when we talk about collective impact, that's feeding South Dakota, uh, it's uh, Youth and Family Services, all of our agencies, Rapid City School District, we all work together very hard to make sure 
that the community has their needs met. Child care is a huge, huge portion. We talk about economic stability and growth in our community. One of our hurdles right now is the lack of child care, and the YMCA is continuing to look for other venues and other agencies that we can partner with to help grow and sustain the need for uh, quality child care in our community. We know that a lot of our families who need child care uh, can't afford to daily subsistence, whether it's for food, housing, all of that put together, and the YMCA is working hard to make sure that we can support our community and the needs that are growing. We also were hoping, we know life skills are really super important. Uh, we, this kitchen design renovation is also designed to improve programming, so culinary skills programming that would be offered to the community. We know that once people can learn how to cook and actually um, uh, uh, learn how to cook, actually learn what nutritious meals are, that's the start to taking care of hunger. So with that, um, I open it up to any questions you may have. Committee have questions. Okay, um, the chair recognizes Bill Spindle. So, Keys, uh, obviously you're trying to take care of the needs of uh, those with uh, food insecure needs. Do you already have a group in mind, you know, like where are you going to focus this new capacity on? You know, what, what your expansion goals are? One of the great partnerships that we put together during COVID, Bill, was working with the Hope Center. And so at the point, they were located, you know, a couple blocks from the YMCA, and so we moved operations down there, supplying food down there. We know the Hope Center is moving. Uh, there's a, a lot of opportunities for partnerships with Hope Center across, across the city, different agencies that I think collective impact helps us identify where those needs are. Um, we also purchased just this last year a mobile vehicle to transport meals. And so as we look at those areas of food insecurity throughout the city, um, our plan is to designate to go to those particular places and help with that um, distribution. Other questions? The chair recognizes Christine Stephenson. Hi, Keys. Um, Hi, Christine. So of the 700 meals a day, how many are um, addressing food insecurity versus how many are daycare and kids stop and camps? That's a great question. Uh, the, the Meals on Wheels program that we provide can feed roughly 100 to 150 a day in the seniors. And again, that's a free will donation but the majority of those people who come into the doors in downtown Rapid City need the meal. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at our camp, um, our child care programs, you know, we have about 20% of, of, of our population in our programming that is either there on scholarship or um, they have a reduced cost to attend our programming because they need it. Just at the regular daycare? There's reduced 20%? Yep. So it sounds like 500 meals a day are for daycare and camps, and 20% of those are addressing food insecurity, and 80% are. Yep. And we don't have all the statistics. We do operate two of the school districts after school Title I programs. We have a program at Robbinsdale, and we also have a program at Canyon Lake. And, and those particular meals, we know that those families that are utilizing our programming after school from the time school gets out until 6 p.m. so their parents can work, we serve a super snack, which is considered a meal. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a snack, because we know that they're going home and they're not getting anything when they go home. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next pr presentation, we're a couple minutes early, so if you need a few minutes, but our next presentation is the Ms. Aluazan Senior Center.
Okay, hello. The Minna Luza Ha, and the N is a little bit silent, is a Lakota word for Rapid Creek. The Minna Luza Ha began as elderly kitchen program in 1971 through the Community Action and was located on Omaha Street. After the flood, a dozen members went to Pierre to explain to the Governor's Advisory Council on Aging why Rapid City needed two senior centers. Mayor Art LaCroix approved the use of the land for, senior, for a senior center and the building was completed in 1976. It provided a congregate site for the Meals Program, now part of Meals on Wheels, to primarily serve low-income elderly and all races of people. It had a dual purpose, serving the hot, nutritious meal, the noon meal, and having a social hour. A home away from home, our motto, enrich your life. Some older folks enjoy staying in their part of town. A hot, nutritious meal is served every day by Meals on Wheels for the elderly, regardless of ability to contribute. There are daily, acti daily activities such as a thrift store, library, exercise room, computer room, and card playing. We also have weekly activities including dances, bingo, ceramics, art class, farmer's table, adult coloring, cooking with friends, and much more. We host community events such as a senior citizen's prom, rummage sales, craft shows, New Year's party, and others. We partner with community-based organizations and allow the use of the building at little or no charge. Such organizations include Rushmore AA, Al-Anon, and NICOA, which stands for the National Indian Council on Aging. Happy Packs is a program that began during COVID that provides a meal for two for elderly folks to address food security. It is by donation, it gives them a way to to stay connected to their senior community if they are not comfortable coming into the building, as at this time it is a drive up for pickup. The Friendship Garden is located on the northeast corner of the property and was a partnership with the Rapid City Garden Club, Pennington County Master Gardeners, Pennington County Housing, and the YMCA Live Well Black Hills grant this year to promote the quality of life for residents in the neighborhood. All are welcome to participate in the handicap accessible elevated and raised garden beds. Membership dues to Minaluza High is affordable for low income individuals at $30 per year and a small activity fee per month. Our future program goals are to spotlight aging as an art and preserve local culture and history to begin with and for example through food and photography. We are working on a cooking program to collect stories and prepare meals to share with the community, as well as a photography contest with high school st photography students and the public to showcase aging as an art. We are asking for funds to fix safety issues of the city-owned building and premises, as well as some needed upgrades. A facelift to the senior center would be greatly appreciated by the citizens who have worked and contributed to society for so many years. First, here are pictures of our needed repairs. Our back room is settling, uh, the floor is settling from the footing. We have uneven sidewalks that needs, need to be fixed. Um, we have windows and doors, some which are original, that are old and leaking. We have some siding that needs to be replaced on the exterior of the building. Also, the sign out front is, um, has the old logo and needs updating um, with a new logo and lighting for the night. 
Um, we need some attention on the parking lot. We have curb stops that are broken. Our lights don't work. They need to be updated. Um, cracks and then we also have painting to be done for the stripes. In one of our rooms called the kitchen annex, we need a heating cooling unit. And then um, we have a gazebo outside um, that um, we'd like to put a concrete pathway to for safety and security to utilize that space right across from all the events at the park and at the Civic Center. So here is a breakdown of the budget, as you all should have. Um, and I won't read them all to you, but I would like to bring your attention to the last one. That's an addition we did recently because in August one of our compressors went out. For $2,500 we had to replace it, so timing of it, we decided to put it on this and see if the vision funds could help us pay for that. Um, this is the contact information. Thank you for your time. Okay, does the committee have questions? Chair, excuse me, Chair recognizes Beth Keeney. Thank you. How many current um, members do you have right now at your senior center? We have about 300, and it's been that way for a few years. Active that are paying the yearly dues? Right, that pay the dues. Mm -hmm. How many come and pay the monthly activity fee? Do they all come 300? No, not all. About how many on average? I, so are we talking pre-COVID or currently? Maybe a little bit of both. Okay. Uh, Pre-COVID, I would say about 150, maybe 200. Now it's likely closer to 100. Those that are participating in some programs, not everyone's coming in the building. But like I said in the, in the presentation, our building is utilized by many folks uh, so most of our members aren't out driving after 3 or 4 o'clock, so our building is available in the evenings. So if you count in AA and all, everyone that comes in and out, pre-COVID it was about 13,000 per year. Um, I think last year it was around 7 with COVID and everything. Thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions? Uh, Chair recognizes Jim Keck. Thank you. Um, you have a lot of projects listed here that you want to take care of. My question is, is why haven't they over the past 20 years been addressed? Or is it all right now? I'm not sure. I've been there four years, almost four years. And, um... It, there's been a, we have a contract with the city. It's a city-owned building. And in the, there's clause in there regarding maintenance. And that is the question. Who's responsible for different parts of the building? For what, for what repairs of the building? What, what does the clause say? I don't have it specifically. Oh. It says that the Minaluzahan Senior Center is responsible for all maintenance of the building. It's very vague contract. And it's the original contract from 1976. And... So with the city generally, we are responsible for the upkeep of the building, which in their mind include pretty much everything, it seems. <laughs> um, but these are some more expensive <coughs> projects that you have. Right. We have asked for different things, roof for the shed, and the response is there's no funds in the budget for that, mm -hmm. and that we're responsible. We're, our budget in a year is within 130 to 150,000 a year, so it is pretty near impossible for us to afford to upkeep this building as if we owned it. Yeah. So that's why we're seeking support here. Do you think, um, so the COVID brought you down to probably 100 active members, do you think? You see that rising back up? Um, membership is free this year, so we have, that's held us numbers a little higher. Um, although phone calls have increased, um, we have our food, the Happy Packs to go, which has gotten to be a bigger program for the community. And so if we just want to talk about numbers, yes, numbers are down, but 
I would urge you as a community, we need to be careful to not let numbers be our only guide for what's important or how we <laughs> take care of things or not. Does Meals on Wheels come to your location and deliver to there and that's where the members We're eat? a congregate site. So um, like, kind of like the YMCA, except we're only for seniors. And they serve lunch every, every noon. Um, and the numbers have been around 4,500 pre-COVID. I think this year we're a little over 1,300. So those are folks coming in and eating. So we have between six and 10 every day. And, um, and then of course they have socialization. And they either stay and do something or they leave. Um, but Meals on Wheels is a big part of the organization. Like you saw in our history, they're the beginning of the Menlo Zahn. <laughs> Well, thank you. You're welcome. Chair recognizes Christine Stephenson. Thanks for your presentation. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you walked in on a situation where you had years of, you know, these problems were developing over years. And here you come four years ago, and it's like, well, we have to fix this. And so if this gets fixed with vision funds or with city funds, do you have plans moving forward to have more, to raise more revenue so that you can take care of the maintenance since it does seem like the city thinks, well, that's their job. <laughs> and you think, well, that's the landlord's job. But um, certainly letting it, letting these problems develop for 20 years and then having to really come and say, we need this right now, um, isn't a good plan. Do you, have you thought about moving forward increasing revenue, ways to increase revenue? Yes, we're working on ways to better serve the new aging population and perhaps changing our hours so we're open later and weekends. So we're working on it, increasing revenue, yes, and just overall impact. I would say once these things are fixed, we're in really good shape. So what we know is we just got a brand new roof in April 2020 through the city whether that was insurance funds or not, I'm not sure, but they did replace the roof. So we know the building is sound. I mean, why would you? <laughs> so we're counting on that to be a sign that it is a sound, good building. And so we have identified the needs we need now. We don't anticipate any large needs structurally in the near future. Um, from after these projects are complete, I'm, we're pretty confident, I'd say, that we can maintain um, the building as it is for some time, of course, with our efforts to increase our revenue and impact. Other questions? Uh, the chair, chair recognizes Kim Morshin. What, um, what area of Rapid City do you serve? Like, what do you call your serving area? Well, we're open to anybody, but we are in the North Central Rapid area right by the Holiday Inn and the Civic Center and the boys the Club for Boys. So we have some very regular members that live in that part of town, North Rapid, you'd say. And they come in every day. That's home. It's in their part of town. And I'm a younger person, and so I didn't live in Rapid City when it was more divided. To me, it's very united. But there was a time, and I think in a lot of some of these folks' lives, the division sort of between the west and this side of town had a great impact on them so i've heard over and over they just this is their part of town this is home and this is where they like to be so um, and it's a low-income part of town and i'm from the history what i read about the in Luzon, that's the reason it was put there to serve the area i have another question so who's so any outreach to the south south part of town robinsdale area there it seems there's a, a senior population there that's not addressed by the west side or by Melusahan. um as far as outward efforts by us no we do put our newsletter i know it's gone to the moose and the elks we we try hard to get that distributed um but as far as the neighborhoods I'd, I'd, I'd accept suggestions as to how to do that. <laughs> so as your board, have they had any fundraising events 
or maybe pre-COVID? Yes, yes, there's been quite a few efforts. Fruit baskets is one we did. Um, we did some Thai food fundraisers to put the gazebo up and just to help get us through COVID. Um, thai food meaning thai, um, the ethnic food. And we are always working on fundraisers to connect with the community to support the Menelouza. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That concludes the uh, fourth public hearing for the Vision Committee. Thank you for coming.